Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? Uh, this is a short video, hopefully, which is meant to elucidate uh, our brothers and humanity from the Ahmadi community. Of course, um, we understand that the Ahmadi community is a small community of about 10 million people worldwide, according to statistics. And then we also understand that they, because of that, uh, because of that, may be susceptible to um, kind of uh, violence or oppression, all these things. And while what the, so the first thing we should actually uh, say out by saying is that whenever you see um, a people who who are susceptible to those things, we should be careful not to twist, you know, ideological points of contention, uh, theological points of contention, which I'm going to raise, in fact, in this video, to uh, religious violence or oppression or anything like that. So that's that's a disclaimer that I want to make. Um, and just for those who don't understand who and what the Ahmadis are, the Ahmadis are a group of people who believe in the Qur'an, the veracity of the Qur'an, and they actually even believe in the Sunnah, uh, the, you know, the, the literature of the Muslims, uh, of the Sunni Muslims, like Bukhari, Muslim, etc. And, um, but they also believe, which is what separates them from the main body of uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, in fact, um, that there was a prophet that came after, they called him Ghulam Ahmed. Now this man was a man who was born in 1835 and died in 1908 and uh, was in British occupied India at that time. Now I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories about him liaising and uh, conspiring with the British. Of course, this is the mainstream kind of narrative within Sunni circles, which is that you know he was com conspiring with the British or he was enacting the British will in that um, you know, uh, he kind of um, uh, unprioritized the uh, the, uh, the uh, obligation of jihad, physical uh, fighting back, because the British at that time um, they had an agenda, of course, to uh, to um, demilitarize, if you like, the aggressing uh, military elements of the Indian uh, colonial peoples. That's a that's a conspiracy, I would call it. Well, it could be true. I'm not going into the details of this now because it's not my area of um, interest at this point in time. Uh, but it's important just to know what kind of narratives are out there. Now, here's what I do want to say, which I think is very important. Um, how do we know a prophet is a prophet? This is a good question. Okay, how do we know a prophet is a prophet? Now, in the Islamic tradition, I've already made the argument that from a completely textual basis, that they cannot be seen to be any prophet that comes after Prophet Muhammad. Why? Because of the, the verse in Surah Al-Ahzab where he's referred to as Khatam and Khatim Nabiyin. So, that he's the seal of the prophets but he's also the final prophet. Now, linguists and mufassirun, exegetes of the Quran throughout all of history have said that this means that he is the final prophet. The prophet himself said in Bukhari, uh, in many different riwayat, in fact, different narrations that La Nabi Abad, there's no prophet after me. Now this is the strongest argument and there are many arguments which are subsidiary to those arguments which are made to show that uh, they cannot be a prophet after Prophet Muhammad uh, from an Islamic perspective. However, there's an argument I want to make today which is a different kind of argument. You see, Ghulam Ahmad himself, who as we've said uh, was quite a modern man in terms of his chronological placement, he says the following, he says that to, dr to judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than prophecies. Um, and he also said, let it be known to the unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or false will be judged on my prophecies. There is no other touchstone for it. And of course, I'm going to provide um, an article with all of the references for these things that he said. So what he's saying is, and this is mentioned, um, this is mentioned in... Um, Uh, in books where I will <coughs> show you the evidences for the references for those uh, particular quotations I just gave. As I'm finding those quotations, what I'm going to say is that I believe that Ghulam Ahmed is actually right on these points. Uh, in fact, it is a good point to make that prophecies are what is required. For example, those two things, to judge my truthfulness or lies, is no better than prophecies, is mentioned in a book called Rohani Khazin, volume 19, page 288. Um, and it's also, let it be known to the unbelieving persons that my truthfulness or falsehood will be judged on my prophecy. <laughs> there is no better touchstone for it, is in Ani Nazimat uh, e Islam, page 288. Of these references, 
I will provide in an article, which I'm basing a lot of this research on. Now, having said that, he's saying basically my prophecies, which is my predictions of the future. This is the touchstone to know if I'm truthful or not. I think this is a very fair test because if someone is being divinely inspired, if someone is being divinely inspired, they should be, in fact, yeah, uh, telling the truth about the future because if God is all knowing, he knows the future as well. Very fair enough. And that is actually one of the challenges we as Muslims make to non-Muslims, that if the Prophet had made a prediction of the future uh, that is time bound, uh, for example, or place bound, uh, that should have materialized. And if it can be falsified, this effectively falsifies his prophethood. It's a very fair enough test because no one knows the future for sure. Now, I want to just introduce you to two prophecies or two or three prophecies that Ghulam Ahmed made. And we want to look at these prophecies and see, was he telling the truth or not? He says, Ghulam Ahmed says in the following, he says, It was revealed to me by the Most High God that I should seek the hand of Ahmed Beg's elder, eldest daughter and to tell them that a kindly treatment shall be dealt to them if they accept the proposal. And that this marriage shall bring to them blessings and blissful uh, beatitude. But if they ref uh, should refuse to do so, the end of the girl shall be very sad. And the man who shall marry her shall die within two and a half years, and her father within three years from the date of marriage. God the Most High will remove every obstacle in the end, bring her into marriage with me. Talking about Allah Muhammad saying this, yeah? And turn the irreligious people into Muslims and bring to guidance those who have lost the right path. It's very clear here. Ghulam Ahmed is saying that he will marry this woman uh, uh, whose name is Muhammadi Begum. Yeah? He's saying that it will happen in this time and if this doesn't happen and so on, then it will be problematic. Now, Ahmed will jump on this and say, well, hold on. He says that if the people repent, there was a condition of repentance. The family, If the family doesn't repent, uh, then all these things will happen. However, even after the family were sending, because they got a little bit worried actually, maybe this guy is telling the truth. So the, the family started writing, you know, letters of apology to the to, to Ahmed, or Ghulam Ahmed, and so on. Even after that, he reiterated. So it can't be because of repentance. He reiterated the same message. He said, even after they supposedly, you know, apologized and so on, but the death of Ahmed ba uh, Beg broke their backs. And this was why they sent letters of apology and regret. So he's acknowledging that they sent, they sent letters of apology and regret. As they were struck by fear and terror in their hearts, it was essential that God the Most High, according to his ancient way, postpone the day of punishment to some later time. That is, to the time when those people again turn back fully to another time of fearing and turning to God is displayed. And it's proved by the whole of the Quran. But the essence of the prophecy that this woman will enter into this marriage with me is an absolute fate. Listen to this carefully. Is an absolute fate which cannot be averted. Now, this is clear. Even after the so-called repentance and apology, it's an absolute fate which, which what? Cannot be averted. He says, so after these days when God the Most High sees that these people's hearts have hardened and that they have not valued the, uh, the few days of respite and relaxation given to them, then he will turn to the fulfillment of the prophecy of his holy word. So you can't say that because, oh, well, the family repented. Because here he's saying he's definitely, she's going to definitely be married with me. But did this happen? Was he ever married to Muhammad Begum? Now this is the question we have to ask because this was saying it's absolute. The answer is no. He never married her and there's no evidence that he married her. In fact, she got married to another man. Now, did all those bad things happen to Muhammad I Begum, did, you know, did Allah break their backs and so on? No. More so, the question is, how can his prophecy be wrong if he knows the future? It seems someone, maybe a, a, a critic will say, this man really wanted to get married to this woman, was using fear tactics to try to uh, persuade the, the woman for marriage, but that, that never materialized. But unfortunately, what that did is it put the cat in with the pigeons, it put the spanner in with the woodworks, because now we can say, that this is a false prophecy, which effectively, you could argue, falsifies his whole uh, claim to prophethood. So by the way, he says this, and I'll give you the, the references in the article. You can check the article and put it in the description box. By the way of prophecy, the exalted God reveals into his humble one that ultimately the elder daughter of Mirza Ahmed Beg, son of Mirza Ghulam Beg, would be married to me. 
these people will resort to great hostility and would put many obstacles in the way. But in the end, it would surely take place. The exalted God, by all possible means, bring her to me, whether a virgin or a widow, and would remove all impediments and would of necessity to the stars, no, uh, no one will be able to prevent it. Right. If, if this has been in the, in the hadith literature of the Prophet that he was saying that this is going to happen, I'm going to marry this woman, and he never did it, imagine what the Orientalists would be doing. They'd be having a field day with this information. Now, subhanAllah, look at this. In addition to this false prophecy, you have a secondary one. He says, it is God's intention, this is him, Ghulam Ahmed, again, God's intention that he will bring two ladies in my wedlock. So again, he, he, about marriage, yeah? One will be a virgin and the other a widow. Therefore, this inspiration that is related to the virgin it has been fulfilled and presented by the grace of God. I have four sons from this wife. I'm still waiting for the fulfillment of the inspiration regarding widow. Now, the thing is, Ghulam Ahmed married twice, both two virgins. He married twice before, and he married to Harmat Bibi and Nusrat Jehan Begum. Both of them, yes, both of them are what? Virgins. Now, the question is, he said, I'm going to marry a virgin and a widow. So, wait a minute. Which is the widow, the widow that he married? Well, someone could argue, well, when he married her, she was no longer a virgin. <laughs> but this is the... And, and she outlived him, so she became a widow. But it doesn't work like that, because he said that she would bring him to, the, I, to my wedlock, Yani, that she was in that state of being a widow already, and then she was brought to my wedlock. Not that I made her the widow, or because of me she became a widow. Yani, so the two things here are interlinked. False prophecies relating to marriage. And so obviously, someone will argue, if it was an orientalist about Prophet Muhammad, say this is uh, self-serving uh, prophecies. Because you want to marry, the orientalist will tell us, you want to, uh, the Prophet wants to marry, and therefore he said, you're going to marry this, otherwise break your back, this and that. They would have a field day with this. And that he did not marry, and so on and so forth. طيب. So imagine if it was us, as the Sunni Muslims would be humiliated uh, in front of the international community with such false prophecies. Moreover, Ghulam Ahmad said, I shall die in Mecca or Medina. And the man never stepped foot in Mecca or Medina. What more do you want, ladies and gentlemen? Let's read the whole thing. Oh, you're taking it out of context. No, I'll read the whole thing for you, brother, because you need to. He said, this, I shall die in Mecca or Medina. Means that before my death, I shall be bestowed victory like that of Mecca. Listen to this. That is to say that the Holy Prophet had vanquished his enemies through the manifestation of majestic signs of Allah. So it will happen now. The second meaning is that before my death I shall be bestowed a victory like that of Medina, which means that people's heart will be their own inclined towards me. The phrase God has decreed, I and my messengers shall prevail points of victory like that of Mecca and the phrase, peace uh, is the word from my merciful Lord, points of victory like that of Medina. Wait a minute. 10 million people in the world, which is the size of London, as a religious community. What? Mecca, Medina. We, I'm mean, sorry to say, how can you even compare the victory of Muhammad وسلم, which stretched yeah, from Mashariq al Ardi ila Maghribiha, from the, the east part of the west to the west part of the west, with such, uh, yani, sorry to say, insignificant gains, uh, comparatively, from a demographic perspective, of Ghulam Ahmed. And let's not forget. Ulam Ahmed told us the truth. He spoke the truth, even though in many instances he did not speak the truth. To, he said, in so saying, he said, to judge my truthfulness or lies, there is no better test than prophecies. Taib, we use the prophecies and we come to the conclusion that actually when you came to predicting the future, you did a miserable job, you did not do the right thing. And therefore, in addition to all of those evidences, that point to the fact that Prophet Muhammad was the final messenger, you also have these clear evidences to the brothers, to the sisters in humanity, the Ahmadi brothers and sisters, which claim, uh, which clearly show unequivocally and unambiguously that Ulam Ahmad made false prophecies. With this, ladies and gentlemen, Allah, I think we have to be humble. And I apologize if I came across a little bit of passion. But this is a very important matter. If we're going to yani, leave Saud al Adam, we're going to leave the bulk of the Muslim uh, body in their reasoning that Prophet Muhammad is the final prophet. The question is, there has to be some incredibly strong evidences. Neither did this man show, Wala Muhammad, that he had uh, a revelation from his own words or from the information that is provided in the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, we, we invite the brothers and sisters from the Ahmadi sect 
to come to a mainstream Islam insha'Allah to just go back to what the Sahaba believed in فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوا وَإِنْ تَوَلَّوا فَإِنَّمَا هُمْ فِي شِقَاقِ فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ اللَّهِ The Quran says if they believe in what you guys believe in then they are on the right path and if they go away from that then they are in transgression I just say to the brothers let's go back to what the Sahaba said on these matters let's see what the Mufassirun said let's see what the exegetes said throughout hundreds of years was the Prophet Muhammad the final Prophet or not did they understand it linguistically as that I think you will find that they did please consider Sunni Islam and we will happy, happily have you with open arms Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh